And so where we wanted to start in thinking about today's presentation mostly stems from how many folks have come to us and talked about what are the regulatory environments that I should be concerned about as a practicing clinician, psychiatrist, um, therapist, whatever your specialization may be, what are the areas that I should be worrying about on a regular basis and be proactive about in order to make sure that I have a compliant practice? There's so many people that have come and talked to us at Valent and at my clinic, the Evidence-Based Treatment Centers of Seattle, that have explained that there's certain criteria in certain areas of their practice that they really do lose sleep over. And this may resonate with you in terms of thinking about uh, ways that could potentially compromise your practice um, and making sure that you are anticipating in a proactive way what those areas are um, so you have a plan in place uh, to ensure the security and safety of your day-to-day -day operations. So by the end of the webinar today, we really want uh, all of you to be able to leave with a better understanding of the legal and regulatory environmental impacts that it could affect your practice, really identifying the associated risks. We'll talk about doing uh, personal risk assessments of your practice and the different types of business structures that those risk assessments could impact or influence. And also review some of the HIPAA policies and procedures in private behavioral health care practice. And we're lucky enough to have Kate Broad with us today and she'll be sharing some of her expert opinions in terms of what those HIPAA policies and procedures need to be in order to increase the level of security of your practice. So first, let's start off at a very high level in terms of how your company will be structured and what some of the pros and cons are of each of the options. Um, at the sole proprietorship level, it's clear that most of the advantages are that there is very easy to create. You have complete control and there's easy tax preparation. But the biggest disadvantage in terms of why people may not go in the direction of a sole proprietorship is because there, you don't have the corporate veil, if you will, in terms of protecting um, any kind of lawsuit from coming after your personal assets. So you are able to secure yourself in other corporate structures um, by having uh, a level of protection and a blanket that's, that separates you from um, any source that may be pursuing any kind of money from your business that they cannot come after your personal assets, um, which creates a, a huge disadvantage for the sole proprietorship wing. For the general, pri general partnership, it's similar to the sole proprietorship. However, it's multiple um, folks that are going to be owning the practice and then we jump over into the limited liability company, which starts um, with creating a corporate veil to make sure that, um, you know, although there, there's similar advantages in terms of owners, tax flexibility, less record keeping, and sharing of profits, um, the biggest advantage is that you will have protection in terms of any lawsuit that's coming towards your direction um, to prevent them from coming after any personal assets that you have. Um, there are self-employment taxes and uh, some role confusion complications that are also involved with limited liability companies compared to sole proprietorships and partnerships. Um, but again, you do have that corporate veil as an LLC. And likewise for the corporation, um, you have the corporate veil, but you have it's a little bit more expensive to form and it does give you the option to create a, a share structure um, for different employees if you'd like. Um, and it also will give you some tax-free benefits along the way. So in terms of running your practice uh, on the day-to-day -day operations side, it's very clear that, um, that you have a disclosure statement, HIPAA statement, and fee agreement that you are expecting all of your clients to sign at the point that they start treatment with you. The, the disclosure statement really helps uh, highlight at a high level highlight the information that your patients need to be aware of when pursuing treatment with you and gives you an opportunity to set expectations right from the beginning. What we know in working with our clients and working um, with difficult clients is that if you don't have those clear expectations set 
and you introduce a new variable to them later on after the course of treatment has started that um, oftentimes folks will get dysregulated and it'll create tension um, between the business and the client, potentially disrupt the rapport that you have with them um, and create tension downstream. So the disclosure statement is an excellent opportunity to anticipate all the concerns that patients could have um, and think about for a second, what are the areas that I've spent the most time with my patients explaining some aspect of my business to them and what, how do I need to write into the disclosure statement with increasing clarity what those components are to prevent downstream tension between me and my clients. So the, the clarifying treatment being provided, outline according to state law, um, disclosure regarding whether treatment provider is under supervision, reiterate various components of fee agreement, outcome measures being a part of treatment, you know, the list goes on in terms of what um, this serves for you in order to clarify what um, your, your treatment will look like and anticipate along the way. Similar with the fee agreements, and I've seen folks with fee agreements actually um, double down, if you will, in terms of being able to put fee agreement information not only in a separate fee agreement, but also in the disclosure statement. So if you have a policy about cancellations, that you put that information into the fee agreement where the clients will be able to see it, but you also put it in the disclosure statement. The disclosure statement sections for cancellations, for example, if you do have a 24-hour cancellation policy and somebody is calling and saying that they can't make it in because they're sick, or because of inclement weather, or because of traffic, or whatever it may be, and potentially come at you and say, how could you not be compassionate towards me and my situation um, when I have this, this cancellation that is clearly justified? What are the ways that you can have your disclosure statement anticipate those calls and clearly outline and stipulate the fact that you um, have to make a business decision at a certain point in running your practice? If you put the cancellation policy in the disclosure statement, have a separate section within the disclosure statement that they actually have to initial. So, you know, not just one signature at the end of the entire disclosure statement, but a cancellation section that they clearly have to initial. So you know that they paid extra attention to what that cancellation policy is. We're in effect increasing their awareness of this cancellation policy. Hopefully they're going to recall it and maybe they won't call you and complain about your cancellation policy or ask for an exception because you so clearly stipulated that information directly in the disclosure statement. Likewise, in the fee agreement, you'll be reiterating it here, really driving it home, making sure that they have a clear understanding of what it is. Um, the phone call components if for groups, for example, if you uh, are running groups, are you, do you want them to pay in advance for the group? Um, do you have a tuition style? Will the group go on regardless of whether the client shows up or not? Do you need to make a business decision to help protect yourself um, to make sure that there are payments that come in because you're paying the provider regardless of whether the number of patients show up or not? Um, all those components should be put in clear language in the fee agreement so they can clearly understand what um, your company's policies are have an opportunity to ask and clarify during their intake and um, be able to go from there in terms of following up with any questions or concerns that they have. So clarity, 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 having expectations and being proactive instead of reactive in terms of how you describe and organize your documents. So the other area of vulnerability um, that I hear a lot about um, from clinicians throughout the country is clinical documentation. Um, how are you going to define when your clinical documentation needs to be complete for the day? Is it going to be within 24 hours? Is it going to be before you, you leave home? Um, at what point are you going to be completing your intake documents? At what point are you going to be completing your, your closing treatment summary reports? If you have this information defined somewhere, where you have essentially an operations manual um, that clearly states when and where and how your intake and clinical progress notes are completed, then you have a, a level of defense when and if you need it to say, listen, this is the policies of my company. This is how I've set it out to be. 
and I'm following what my company's policies are based upon my personal risk assessment of when I need to complete my intake or clinical documentation for the day. And of course, you may have influence from Medicare, Medicare contracts or insurance company contracts that will push um, the needle in certain directions in terms of when you should complete this clinical documentation in a timely manner. Then there's components on regulation regarding Medicare and Medicaid. So for Medicare and Medicaid, you need to make sure that you're <coughs> being completely adherent to all the points that are stipulated in the contract with Medicare and Medicaid. Do you have to have treatment plans? Do they need to be co-signed by multiple providers? Do you need to have them periodically, once a month, quarterly, <coughs> semi-annually, annually? Whatever it may be, making sure that you're adherent to those um, treatment planning requirements to make sure that you aren't penalized in reimbursement. Do you qualify for any meaningful use criteria? Could you get any of the incentive money that is out there for Medicare and Medicaid uh, providers? Um, right now there is a significant amount of money available for prescribers and some nurse practitioners who are contracted with Met for Medicaid uh, where you can actually qualify for the incentive money but it's really a carrot and stick approach and we'll get to that a little bit later uh, in terms of making sure that A, you're entering the meaningful use criteria for Medicare, Medicaid, and B, if you don't, um, then you will be penalized and have a lower reimbursement. And then being mindful of the correct coding and billing. And as we've seen, um, for example, for Medicare, Medicaid and different insurance companies, uh, for psychiatrists who are billing 99214s, or 99215s, uh, there's a high frequency of audits that are occurring throughout the country. Um, and likewise for therapists who are billing 90837s and 90834s, um, you know, there's an opportunity and potential for audits to occur and to justify why you coded a session the way that you did. And for folks who are not contracted with Medicare, have you successfully opted out? Have you reached out to Medicare and opted out as a provider? Do you ask in your intake with your clients whether they're contracted with Medicare? Um, most of you probably are already aware that if you see a Medicare client and you have opted out and they come to see you, then they need to fill out documentation that needs to go back to Medicare to make sure that they understand that they're not going to be receiving benefits through your company and they're foregoing their Medicare benefits in order to seek services with you. So that's an important component that each practice needs to be mindful of in terms of making sure that they've completed the documentation required for opting out for Medicare patients. So why do we talk about all this? HIPAA statements, fee agreements, disclosure statements, when to complete clinical documentation. These are all the highest point of vulnerability of day-to-day -day operations of any practice within the country for behavioral health care. So what are the most common categories for lawsuits? Cases related to children, um, any uh, situations that involve suicide, and any evaluations that are done, consultations or professional evaluations in terms of what people are qualified to do or not. Now, all of those um, are heavily influenced in terms of whether the lawsuit is won or not lost based upon whether clinical documentation is completed. The most common reason for a lawsuit to be won or lost is whether clinical documentation has been completed or not. It creates a tremendous amount of vulnerability for a practice to not have support for why uh, certain actions were taken throughout the course of treatment and we've seen time and time again through case law um, that clinical documentation is the number one reason for why these cases are won or lost. And this is according to um, the biggest behavioral health care malpractice uh, providers throughout the country that have shared this information with us. So what's the standard coverage um, for malpractice to make sure that we have the adequate amount of coverage? And it's typically a million dollars for the provider, and if you have a group practice, having it be three million for the group. Um, the, I think what it comes down to in terms of what works best for your practice is based upon understanding that if you do have a group practice, that the individual provider although they are named in a lawsuit 
or because they take they took some action that was negligent clinically that they may be responsible for from a malpractice perspective at the end of the day the organization who hired the employee is equally as liable as the employee who performed that negligent action and that's an important distinction to be made right from the beginning because that means that there's going to be a lot of case law out there that you'll see um, lawsuits that will go after the practice and the provider they'll go after the three million dollar policy or the one million dollar policy for the provider and sometimes both so you want to make sure that you find a malpractice carrier that's oriented in behavioral health care understands the implications of various situations what to do in cases of a subpoena what to do in, in situations of a court order um, how to respond when and if there is a suicide that happens within your practice and how to respond in a um, diligent way that's according to best practices within um, within law and making sense of how to protect yourself um, from everywhere within the organization from day-to-day -day operations fee agreements disclosure statements um, HIPAA statements and interacting and completing your clinical documentation on a regular basis so I mentioned early, earlier the importance of having an operations manual and I think smaller practices in terms of solo providers may not have the need for an operations manual um, but I always recommend it to folks who are thinking about it because of the fact that it provides a true defensible set of policies and procedures that explains your train of thought before any event happens so you're able to articulate in a document why you perform the risk assessment that you did for running your practice on a daily basis where your risks are as an organization and why you've developed the policies and procedures that you have in response to those day-to-day -day operation risks that um, your practice is presented with it provides that train of thought it provides a defensible set of information that you can present to other entities who may be asking questions and then if you're a group practice then you have clear policies that are very understandable um, and transparent for all employees to work under. So there's no, no confusion about what the expectations are. No provider can say that they didn't know because you have the document to support it. And um, this has to be a document that is living, that you are continually updating and editing on a regular basis and that you set a date to um, republish essentially each year because as we know the DSM codes are changing the CPT codes are changing HIPAA laws adjust accordingly um, and as the regulatory environment adjusts your practice needs to adjust you need to continually be doing your own personal risk assessment of your practice um, and make sense of it to the point where your policies and procedures reflect it and stay current So what are the regulations impacts? And I think that we also mentioned this earlier in terms of the carrot and stick approach for meaningful use requirements. They really are having the incentive money as being the carrot, right? So you need to enter this information um, into an electronic medical record and complete all the, the data requirements in order to receive your meaningful use stimulus money. And if you don't, then you're going to be penalized. So we have the carrot that we're experiencing now and very shortly we're going to be experiencing the stick where we are going to experience a little bit of a penalty um, for folks who are not um, fulfilling the requirements of meaningful use. And for those people who have meaningful use requirements um, who are eligible for the incentive money, those are nurse practitioners for Medicaid and um, MDs for Medicare and Medicaid. And the CPT coding, you know, making sure that you're adherent and aware of what CPT code is appropriate in what scenario. So, uh, as I mentioned before, understanding complexity-based coding for E&M, um, for psychiatrists, understanding what the difference is between a 90834 and what the cutoff is for moving it into a 90837 um, for therapists. Um, if you're not responsible for that and don't have the clinical documentation to support the time-based coding that you did or the complexity-based coding that you did, then you leave yourself vulnerable 
for audits with different insurance companies, for audits with um, CMS, um, and that could lead to more downstream uh, penalties and nightmares for each practice. And then the DSM-5 and ICD-10, making sure that you're educated and aware of the changes that are coming down the pike and that you're using the most adherent uh, DSM-5 and ICD-10 code that is relevant for your session. Um, and there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of material that people are sharing, um, but be proactive rather than reactive about it because it's another point of vulnerability in terms of responding to the regulatory environment. So uh, we've also received a, a tremendous number of questions um, about the Affordable Care Act and what are the implications to behavioral health care providers and how to make sense of all the changes that have occurred through the Affordable Care Act. And what we've come to find is a couple things. First, it's, it's interesting to point out that CMS uh, is really publishing a lot of information about how um, expensive um, health care is in America, right? That's the whole reason why the Affordable Care Act kind of started in the, in the beginning. And they published a lot of information about the cost of, of blood pressure, of people who have hypertension, of folks who have diabetes in America. Um, and right shortly thereafter, they also started publishing a lot of information about how behavioral health care is one of the biggest modifiers for the number of people in America who have hypertension and who have diabetes. And um, so there's been a big push to actually recognize at that federal level the importance of, of making sure that we have uh, the right treatment and the right reimbursement and the right incentive for behavioral health care providers to, pro to be able to provide behavioral health care treatment. Um, and we all know that parity was established a long time ago, but um, there are still entities that are out there that really aren't paying attention to parity um, and some people that aren't necessarily providing the same amount of reimbursement for behavioral health care as they are for primary care providers. Um, and just this year, the DSM-5, for the first time, any DSM manual um, has actually gone as far as saying um, that there needs to be a PHQ-9 that's used for outcome measures on a regular basis. So I'm going to I'm going to connect those two in just a second. What has occurred because of the the push for um, seeing that behavioral health care is a modifier for hypertension and for diabetes, two of the highest costs of the healthcare system in America, is that they know that it's for CMS that you have um, for diabetes you get your blood glucose levels checked periodically and are able to assess. Um, exactly whether the treatment being provided is working, is effective, or whether you need to tweak it as a primary care provider. And likewise, for hypertension, that you're getting your blood pressure checked on a regular basis. CMS wants, and, and, and also um, commercial insurance companies, also want a similar approach, an evidence-based care approach to having some source of standardized measure that can be used to assess whether treatment in behavioral health care is working or not. They want a higher level of accountability for people to have an understanding to communicate whether the treatment is effective. So when I mentioned that the DSM-5 actually published um, that, hey, the PHQ-9 should be the recommended standardized outcome measure for assessing depression, it's because of the amazing push that they're doing um, to get people to really start using um, outcome measures on a regular basis and we're also hearing from a lot of clients that they're using these outcome measures and successfully negotiating reimbursement rates with insurance companies as a result of using the outcome measures on a regular basis um, and the outcome measure you know world in terms of having different outcome measures for different diagnostic categories in the DSM-5 is being adopted at a much significant higher rate as a result of the um, influence of CMS and the information that's in the DSM-5 and renegotiating insurance contracts with insurance providers. So it's just an interesting editorial in terms of the implications of the Affordable Care Act and ways in which um, we as providers can look at 
how to adjust our day-to-day -day operations um, to make sure that we are adherent to what those requirements are going to be coming down the pike. And I anticipate seeing a lot more, um, a lot more discussion about other standardized outcome measures that can be used to really be able to better understand whether somebody is improving or not throughout the course of behavioral health care treatment. And then compliance, um, making sure that we have compliance and completion in, in um, a timely manner, and provider-driven content reported to funding sources, example being a treatment plan. So when I think about um, policies and procedures, I had mentioned this earlier, and from a HIPAA standpoint, you really have to do your own risk assessment. Everybody's responsible based upon HIPAA to perform their own risk assessment and understand the implications of different components of running your practice which may be specifically unique to you. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. Each practice is going to run their operations at a different speed, at a different tempo, with different client demographic, um, and, and be in a different location. And based upon all those variables, you need to identify what those risks are to you and perform that risk assessment and document it. Have that documented, have it be supported so you, anybody who asks um, why you do any type of, of uh, practice that you have at your location, that you have a defensible set of criteria that you have met um, and that you have taken action on to make sure that you um, best meet your risk assessment that you perform. And then I think the other core component of HIPAA is minimum information necessary. So you'll see this language spread throughout the entire HIPAA statements that you'll read. Um, and minimum information necessary is the cornerstone of um, the HIPAA Privacy Act and making sure that we're not sharing information at, at our leisure, um, but we have information that's being shared. Um, at a rate that's consistent with what's the most responsible for protecting the identity of any patient. So if you need to transfer information that you've transferred the minimum information necessary in order to collaborate care with another provider and nothing more. And then for PHI security, server backup, web-based, make sure that you have standard safeguards and that you abide by all the CFR regulations and that the structural design in terms of a, a secure workplace has um, a workflow that will minimize the HIPAA com compliance concerns that any practice may experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So how can you set up structurally your business? Do you have certain desk notes that you would like to be able to store behind um, the, the front desk? What happens when um, the, the cleaning folks come in at the end of the night? Is it accessible to them? Um, do you have filing cabinets that you may need to store confidential information in? Do you have a secure HIPAA gate that actually encloses that information and has a different key to prevent folks from being able to go into it? These are areas of structural design um, that you can set up that also include how your computer screens are being seen, whether your um, waiting rooms have a HIPAA glass window that closes or opens to prevent any, anybody in the waiting room from being able to hear any conversations that occur in the office. These are all a part of your own risk assessment that need to be discussed on a daily basis. Um, not daily basis, but be thought about on a daily basis and reviewed at least yearly. The next big topic in HIPAA is understanding how to respond to a lot of the email, text, phone, as technology improves. What are the areas that we need to make sure that we are designed to understand in order to protect um, health information um, from practice to practice, from provider to um, patient, and from admin st staff to patient, admin staff to providers? Um, and what we see for email is that you know, it's really recommended to make sure that you have a secure email platform that will allow you to send a secure email to a client. That's number one highest recommendation from any malpractice provider um, out there in the country. 
if you don't have access to a secure system or aren't able to buy it, that you at least have disclosure in your disclosure statement saying that the patient understands the implications of sending a insecure email and that they had the opportunity to ask any questions about that insecure email and that they are okay with the potential ramifications of sending email insecurely. So that's a big area to think about and I think um, people oftentimes that we come across will, won't necessarily think about um, email as being discoverable because they don't think that it's quote unquote a part of the clinical chart. This is a very big misconception in the community because email texts um, are is data that the client has that other providers potentially have and if you don't if it's defined in the court order that they are expected that the provider is expected to provide the entire clinical chart including any client communication and you don't supply that email that you sent that has clinical implications or supply a text message that you sent but the patient does supply the email and does supply the text message then there's points of vulnerability there that you provided information that's different than the patient did for the legal proceedings. Um, and so that's an example where you could get yourself into a pickle in terms of not um, providing all the information that is required and know that everything is discoverable in the eyes of the law. If, if it's required by a court to receive the information, you have to abide by it and make sure that um, you're supplying that information. Some folks think that psychotherapy notes um, don't necessarily need to be a part of the chart. There are components of a HIPAA statement that um, outline what it means to have psychotherapy notes be in a different section. But we've seen in certain cases that if a judge asks for the psychotherapy notes that it is discoverable information. So that's something to, worth pointing out along the way. And then phone calls and text messages, as I mentioned earlier, making sure that you're doing the clinical documentation for this. And as you talk to a client and you provide any kind of um, quick tips or coaching or do any med management um, selections when you're out of office, that there is a requirement to make sure that you're doing the clinical documentation that's attached to that phone call and making sure that you have that text message that you remember to figure out how to get it into the clinical chart and have it be a part of their official patient chart. Telehealth. So telehealth has been um, increasingly popular over the last couple years uh, for all the right reasons. And um, the tendency for folks to go to Skype rather than using a secure platform has also increased. Um, but what we're seeing is that, to be clear, Skype is not uh, a HIPAA-compliant application um, that, again, patients need to understand if there is, um, if there is a need to use Skype um, to make sure that they're understanding the risks associated with it. That is an insecure application um, and that that's also provided in the disclosure statement. There are a number of telehealth companies that are now offering services that are very qualified, very um, thorough. Their, their processes make it very easy for the patient to engage, for the provider who may not be tech savvy to initiate treatment in that way. Um, and those are all encrypted video conferencing platforms. Um, and making sure that they're encrypted is the key word. Encryption is key. Um, and making sure that the information that's being um, transferred from different locations is secure. The other area to point out along the way is licensure. When you are doing telehealth and if you're providing telehealth to a, a patient in a different state that you are sensitive to what licensure may or may not be needed as you provide that treatment in a different state that jumps into a different jurisdiction. 
So now I want to jump over into understanding what a breach is um, on, on, on the HIPAA side of the coin. And I want to bring in Kate Broad, who has significant experience in terms of understanding the implications of making any kind of HIPAA breach. Um, because um, how you respond to a HIPAA breach will really define and help along the way um, how different entities will respond to you in terms of your risk assessment that you provided and they'll either be reassured and confident about your explanation or they'll be um, very concerned along the way. Um, so HIPAA for the most part in terms of when you do a breach I, I mentioned several times and just to reiterate how important it is to do your own um, risk assessment in terms of understanding the risks associated with your practice and document that. Document, 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 making sure that you have all the information down in terms of understanding where the risks are of your practice and what measures you've taken to ensure the safety of that information across the board to protect the health information of your patients. If there is a breach, then the next steps that we'll have to discuss is what you need to document from there to make sure um, the patients are notified and everything else, but I wanted Kate to be able to jump in and also help define what a breach means to her. Sure. So a HIPAA breach is any time that personal protected health information is shared, whether intentional or unintentional. The most common HIPAA breaches are elevator talk and coffee shop talk, where you're just talking with a coworker about a patient that's come in. The other most common is directly related to health information technology and it's stolen laptops and other mobile devices such as cell phones. Um, and again, as Micah said, the key is documentation. If any of those happen, you just need to document it and make sure that it is um, traceable if you are audited. Thank you, Kate. And the next question that I want to be able to pull Kate in on as well is what to do. So we want to document in terms of understanding what our risks are for understanding HIPAA. Um, but what actions do we need to take when we do make a breach? And um, the first is a brief description of the breach to the patient, um, description of the types of unsecured PHI and the steps the in individual should take. Um, complemented by the steps you have taken as the covered entity to mitigate the harm and protect against further breaches. So HIPAA looks at this as, okay, the breach happened, we understand, we get it, but what have you done to learn from it to prevent it from happening again down the road? And what measures have you taken operationally, structurally, internally to make sure that this offense doesn't happen in the, into the future? And how can you document that information to demonstrate to us that you have taken those necessary actions? And Kate, is there any other levels of, of response that you should take to notify patients? Um, I, I think you covered most of it there. Um, some important things to note is that the, the way that you contact the patient, it should be in written format and mailed to them unless you've received explicit consent from them that email notification is acceptable. Um, and there are lots of different levels of HIPAA breaches and the biggest one and the number to remember is that if you have a HIPAA breach that's over 500, things start to change. You are required to notify everyone with written format. If you have over 10 patients that you don't have updated contact information for, you are able to per, or call them with a phone number that you have, but you will have to post onto your website or to a major media with a toll-free number for patients to call to talk about the possible breach of their data. And you'll also need to notify the secretary on the Department of Health and Human Services website. That is, again, for over 500 patients. If it's less than 500 patients that have that have a possible HIPAA breach, you can do that annually. And it just take note of it. Again, this is where documentation is key, and you take note of everything. And Kate, what would be an example of a scenario where 500 patients would potentially have a breach? Sure, that's a great example. Um, if you lose your laptop, and it has all of your clinical documentation on it, and it's not locked, and someone's able to get into it, that's 
Again, that's the most common way. Another way would be if you were sending patient records in a, bat a batch amount and you sent it to the wrong fax number. Got it. Thank you. And I think it's been clear over time that clients who receive this information um, are will will be definitely concerned that there was a breach, um, but will also appreciate understanding what actions you have taken um, to minimize this happening into the future and what needs to happen right away to help protect their information currently. So on the question side, um, in terms of contacting your professional limited uh, professional liability carrier, um, you can contact them. Um, I think that there's a lot of different sources out there in terms of different liability carriers that you can use. Again, I would really recommend finding one that is very behavioral health care oriented, that understands uh, what actions you need to take to put into place from an operations perspective um, and a, from a structural perspective uh, in terms of preventing uh, HIPAA regulatory, HIPAA statement, fee agreement, disclosure statement issues from cropping up. Because they've seen it time and time again, they, ha they can share so much uh, wealth of information uh, to make sure that there's clarity about what actions you need to take as a provider and learn from all the other mistakes that any other provider has experienced. And then um, the question of can I contact patients by phone if there's an imminent risk at their, if that their PHI will be misused. Uh, Kate, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, so again, it's best to contact them in written format. It should be first class mail unless you have written consent that the patient is okay receiving notification through email. Great, and I think we discussed what notice must I give breach to affect over 500 patients, but the last question of what if the breach involves PHI of minors, incapacitated patients, or deceased patients? Sure. So in the case of minors, it always goes to the parents, the guardian, or the persons that, that are acting as the parent, unless the minor seeks the treatment without the parent's consent. In that case, then the minor is considered a patient and the individual responsible for their own HIPAA rights. Um, incapacitated patients, the person who makes all of the health care decisions is responsible for uh, being notified of misuse of PHI, and for the deceased, it is set to go to the next of kin, um, and again, that's by first class mail unless there's written permission to get things electronically. Great. Thank you, Kate. So we've received, uh, that, that concludes our um, presentation for today, um, but there have been several questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is, uh, is the HIPAA notice the right place to address our practices policies regarding email and their lack of encryption? Um, and I think that the HIPAA notice as well as the disclosure statement um, are the two places that that should be oriented and I, I don't think it's bad um, to be able to put it in both and um, for email in terms of the disclosure statement for them to be able to, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of not having one signature at the bottom of your disclosure statement, but having the opportunity to put multiple signatures throughout the document to make sure that they read through the areas that are the most sensitive to you in your practice. If email is a sensitive topic that you want to prevent people from making any, um, in creating any kind of confusion about, then I would create a separate section within your disclosure statement that requires them to actually sign that section um, with their initials or a full signature. We use a published, the second question is, we use a published system tracker. Will that be accepted to as an alternative to PHQ-9? Um, I think that there's a lot of variation in terms of the different trackers for different symptom categories that exist. Um, when, when you say accepted as an alternative to PHQ-9, you would have to contact your insurance company or your uh, CMS provider um, to have clarity about, okay, you expect me to use standardized outcome measures. What do you expect me to officially use in anticipation of the requirements that are coming down the pike? Um, and how do you want me to roll them out? And I would document that conversation and make sure that you have the data to support why you took that action. 
And then the third question is, do email text appointment reminders need to be kept as a part of the client's chart? Um, again, I think this is your own personal risk assessment as a provider to determine um, whether something of this nature should or should not be a part of the clinical chart. I've seen um, it be in both ways that practices consider administrative functions not to be a part of the clinical chart in terms of scheduling appointments. Um, other people definitely want to use them and have uh, sensitive implications for running their practice along the way. And then Kate, do you want to take the last question? Sure. The question is, must notification be published if the breach is over 500? And that is accurate. It must be published, and it must be published to local media, where most of the patients that were affected uh, will be able to see that. And then, again, it has to be reported on the Department of Health and Human Services website, and that's hhs.gov. Great. Thank you, Kate. And let's see, are there any other questions that are coming in? It looks like one more question is being posted. Um, and again, you can post directly through the webinar, um, and we get them as they come in. So what types of secure email platforms have been successful? Um, I know that there's a lot of electronic medical records that actually have secure email platforms baked into them. Um, so I think that a good idea would be to start with your EMR provider to understand exactly what, what's possible for um, secure messaging. And most systems actually don't call it um, email, per se, but actually refer to it as secure messaging between um, platforms um, to make sure that clients are able to access the information um, and respond directly to them. Um, and then aside from EMR systems, I know that there are several secure email systems that exist independently of, of EMRs. And it looks like we have one more question coming in. Um, so the last question that came in is, have you identified a preferred EMR for psychologists? Um, to be completely transparent, we do work for Valent Medical Solutions, um, which is, you know, as far as I am aware, the uh, kind of owner of the behavioral health care space for electronic medical records and clinical documentation scheduling um, and patient portal communication in terms of secure messaging. Um, there are other there are other uh, great platforms that are out there, but um, may not be oriented truly towards behavioral health care. Um, our system, because Dr. David Lishner um, has started using the system out there in 2005, and we've been in business for about nine years, um, has a good understanding of what the needs are of day-to-day -day operations for behavioral health care providers and has teamed up with a number of psychologists at his practice that I am also the chief operating chief financial officer of um, the EBT centers of Seattle. Um, and I think that once you have as many providers as Valent does, um, ranging from all different levels and all different credential levels, um, we have a tremendous amount of data of what works the best for day-to-day -day operations to help create a successful practice. Um, so I think it's worth looking into and there are several other, as I mentioned, um, healthcare-oriented electronic medical records that exist, but whether they have the behavioral healthcare focus is uh, an area to think about. Thank you so much, Micah and Kate. And please know I'll be sending the resources through to you, uh, as well as a recording of this presentation. Please also send through any questions that we didn't have time to answer today, and I'll be sure that they're answered by either Kate or Micah or myself. And uh, please also ask if you'd like any more information on Valence Electronic Medical Record. Thank you so much for joining us today, and stay tuned for Chapter 4 of our Practice Success Series. Thank you.